Did you want me to? What do I do now? Could you you could just go join the panel here, okay. and we'll we'll take some so you're questions. You what ought you to do now, or? Yes, what ought yeah. I to do now? And do you have a fundamental rule? That Are you treating me as God? Is that what's happening? <laughs> Carolyn. It, it sounds like you're saying you not only don't have to scare the crap out of people, I mean that you, we no. shouldn't scare the crap out of people, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's okay. there. It's there Social already. Social motivation is very, very powerful. But let me say, in most people. So there is such a thing as a sociopath. And what do you do to those people? Well, it doesn't help if you convert them to a religion. And it doesn't help if you just try to scare them. They're very dangerous, they're very scary, and people with you know, frontal symptoms in general are very scary. And we have to deal with them. And that's a whole sort of other talk. Uh, and maybe someday we'll actually find ways of neurally intervening you know, to bring about better socialization. But by and large, you don't have to teach, just as you do not have to teach a mother to love the baby that she's suckling. If she doesn't, we assume there's something pathological, and all of the exhortation in the world makes not a whit of difference. But by and large, I mean, the biochemistry is just hugely powerful. Last week I went on a radio show called Fox News. And, <laughs> and there were people phoning in, and one man phoned in, and he said, that it, he said that if he didn't believe in God, there would be nothing to stop him killing and raping and stealing. And so I said, you mean you would kill if you didn't believe in God? And he said, yes. And I said, who would you kill? He said, I would kill my neighbor. Really? Well, I, I'm sure that <laughs> his neighbor should definitely be on the lookout. I, I said... <laughs> I said, you're not a very good advertisement for, for religion, but I, yeah. suspect, I suspect he's not that uncommon. Yeah, I mean, violent behavior is, is, of course, very, very, very worrisome. And I mean, the other part of the story that I think is, is really important, and I know some of you have heard me go on about this before, but I like to think that, you know, we found this mo animal model now for social attachment, and we want to understand how you extend the attachment beyond the immediate family to the group, as it does, say, in baboons and chimps and so forth. But what I want is an animal model for in-group attachment and out-group hostility, because that's where the real killing lies. I mean, that's where it is in the case of chimpanzees. We all know now that chimpanzees do this thing where the males get together of an evening, things are nice, no problems. They go quietly creeping off and they get to the border of their territory. They find a lone chimp. They don't sort of kill it in the way they would if they were hungry. They kick it, they bite it, they rip it apart, they leave it to die in the most miserable way or else they kill it. And we do it. We humans do that. And what I'd like to know is what the biochemistry is there. And how to, as Roger would say, how to incentivize us so that that doesn't happen. But that's the real moral issue, I think. I mean, um, and, and, it's actually and the worse Bible than actually doesn't, doesn't seem to say you can't do that. Uh, and a lot of folks in the Bible do do just that. I think it's important to point out that in those killings as well, the genitals are ripped off. I mean, that's right. If you Thank know you. anything about inclusive fitness, you'd have at least a story on why that would be a, a place to yeah. be um, attacked. Uh, Ralph Greenspan. Yeah. Ralph Greenspan, Neurosciences Institute. I also want to extend the evolutionary aspect of this a step further, because right. as you as you sort of alluded to, there is actually a great deal of genetic variation in the prairie voles. Yes. As to as to who, as to how much they have, That's right. which means that it is not under such strong selection that it takes over the population. That's right. So they, so there is an interesting tension, which may well be the source of many of our ills, between the cultural and social imperatives of conformity and the genetic imperative of variation. Yeah, that's very interesting, Ralph. I mean, that's a really deep point. With somebody already up there has a microphone. Oh, it's Stan Siegel. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, Dan Siegel from UCLA, Department of Psychiatry and the Center for Culture, Brain, and Development. Um, thank you for your talk and introducing attachment. Just to uh, address three areas of science that, that people may be familiar with, but just to tie them into, with your presentation. Um, in my own work, I work in the field of attachment, attachment research, and uh, trying to look at the fundamental ways where families, in fact, have a kind of moral compass that you're saying is kind of natural to the way they are. In human beings, we have a whole field of, of science, mm -hmm. actually, it looks into this. And rather than just looking at genetics, we actually see experience oh, sure. and me, in, in very deep ways and cr across the generations, uh, finding transmission of behaviors you might call unethical or at least not optimal for thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we have interventions that can alter those paths. So there, there actually is a lot of empirical data about that. Um, but to, to uh, address the other issues in terms of these neural mediators of in-out uh, uh, membership of response. Two studies sort of come to mind. One are certainly, um, you know, uh, terror management or, or mortality salient studies where, you know, you expose someone to a sense of danger and even subliminally images of death. And then you find that there's a intensification of the evaluation of, of the individual they're presented with subsequently as being either an in-group or out-group. The in-group person is treated with more kindness the uh, outgroup person is treated with a lot more hostility. Now, just building on that, which is a, not a neural study, but there's some unpublished work that's coming out of Harvard and Dartmouth that actually shows that if you present faces, that is photographs of people to, these are Dartmouth undergraduates, but anyway, to college students, um, you can show that the medial prefrontal cortex is activated. This is an area involved in, in theory of mind and, and empathy. It's activated if the small written summary is such that the Dartmouth college student will feel that that person is like them. So it'll be a given face. Let's say it's a face of a Korean individual. They'll say, this person you know, graduated college at Dartmouth, went on to Cambridge, works at a dot-com, loves you know, this kind of activity. The person's medial prefrontal acti activity is high. They show the same photograph only the summary of the same exact face says, this person grew up in Seoul, he never graduated high school, works in a garage, and you know, likes to play with Barbie dolls, and there's no medial prefrontal activation. And the person just has no sense of connection. So we're learning that, in fact, there are these neural mechanisms of in-out group membership, and there are ways that we can consider in terms of a society that's based on science of actually promoting awareness of that so that, in fact, you don't go ahead and rip people's genitals off if you're aware, in fact, that if something happens in a country that makes you have mortality salience activated, you're very likely to look at people not like you and go blow them up. So if you actually use your prefrontal cortex to rise above those kinds of innate uh, biological reactions, you might actually alter the course of human history. Dan, uh, I think there's a couple of good points there, and we'll, we'll be going to those later this afternoon. The lady in the red over there with the scarf on is Mazarin Banaji, and you guys should talk. Yeah. Um, uh, Mazarin will be talking about this a little later on. Uh, I, I was just going I to... See, do you want to respond before well, I, I see, just going I see to follow Sam up Harris is appropriate uh, in, in case not everybody knows this experiment, but Paul Zak... Uh, Paul Zak then asked, well, you know, uh, how could... I mean, if oxytocin, which it turns out uh, in animal studies to show that it lowers anxiety levels and makes people, you know, feel a little more comfortable and so forth. So Paul, Zach, and some guys thought, well, suppose we put it in an aerosol and just shoot it up people's nose because the olfactory bulb is a fast way into the brain. I won't summarize exactly how the data went. Uh, I mean, how, the, but it was one of these tasks where, you know, you give somebody money and you have to trust them that they will give you money back and so forth. The, the, the basic line is that the people who got the oxytocin up the nose were much more trusting than the normal controls. Um, and then they did it not with oxytocin up the nose, but just with massage. I really like this one. And if you just give the undergraduates a really nice massage before they go in to play this game, they act as though they had oxytocin. Oh, that's obviously Ted Haggard's... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, but he didn't take it. We'll, we'll get on to that yeah. later. 
Um, so uh, just to let you know, there is actually circulating uh, yeah. oxy oxytocin Sorry. in here right now. So. <laughs> uh, Sam. Yeah, uh, Sam Harris, infidel. Uh, <laughs> so I, I thought I thought both Pat and uh, Steve brought together some very necessary uh, pieces of, of uh, perspectives here. I just want to try to uh, push it a little bit further uh, to allay the fears of religious people. Who uh, it seems to me that this question of morality really is the, is the Gordian knot that needs to be cut at the level of our culture, that, that the link, the, the imagined link between morality and religion uh, is really the myth that is circulating here that, uh, that, that we should deflate. And I think you have said that the necessary things to deflate it. Uh, two things. One is that this idea that we, we should be skeptical that uh, atheism can foster uh, the basis for a civil society. I think it's instructive to look at the most atheistic societies in the developed world. The one you find, we in the United States are really an outlier. If you take the, the, the top 20 uh, societies as ranked by the UN's development index, which, which but incorporates almost every indices of, of moral behavior that you'd be interested in, like violent crime and, and infant mortality and ge generosity to the developed world. Um, you find that, first of all, the, the U.S. is the only society, uh, with the possible exception of Ireland in the top 20, that really lives at all under the shadow of, of this kind of religiosity. Uh, and the other societies are the most atheistic societies uh, around, apart from the, the communist bloc societies, which, which have their own dogmatism to worry about. Uh, but you look at societies like Holland and Denmark and Australia and Iceland and Norway, uh, societies where the level of belief in God is really the, the inverse. I mean, they're, they're all like the, the National Academy of Sciences, essentially, in, in, in Sweden, uh, on this question of, of uh, a personal God. Um, the other, well, if, it's ridiculous, Harry, if it's ridiculous, Harry, we, can, we can address it, but it's, it's the, the level of, of, of atheism in, in Sweden is 60, somewhere between 60 and 85 percent, depending on how the, the, the uh, uh, question is asked. Um, uh, the other piece, though, is that this question of whether there are really right and wrong answers to, to, to questions of, of uh, good and evil. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you translate good and evil into questions of, of happiness and suffering, which I think you have and which I think uh, uh, Spinoza has, mm -hmm. um, you, then you need only posit that there are really right and wrong answers to questions of how human beings and, and other conscious beings can maximize their happiness. And it seems to me we have very good reason to believe that there are right and wrong answers there. And we know that something, for instance, like honor killing or female genital mutilation is not a good strategy for, to maximize human happiness, to raise people to feel compassion to, for other people, for instance. And we know that compassion and love and, and, and even self-transcending love can be part of a, an enlightened selfishness that, uh, of, of the sort that Spinoza, Spinoza may, may uh, uh, advocate. And so th this, this opposition between selfishness and selflessness breaks down when you, ta when you talk about how we can maximize happiness. And, and uh, there's, a, there's just massive convergence there. And we, I think if, if, if Michael Persinger could get his helmet perfectly tuned so as to dial in you know, every state of mind that, that people think uh, is a happy one, we would have convergence. I mean, we would all, we'd be able to say, well, Dalai Lama state number 21, uh, is, is almost as good as Dalai Lama State number 23. And it, maybe we, we wouldn't have perfect convergence, but we would have, it wouldn't be that every possible brain state is equivalent at the level of happiness. And, and so. For technical reasons, like a tape change, we actually have to take a break now, which is probably a good idea. So we could take a very brief break, and we'll, we'll come back after the break, and we'll, this conversation will continue.